on a lonely planet slowly spinning its way to damnation amid the incompetence and unpreparedness of lesser space programs, one team stands resilient against the herds, putting their lives on the line to aid those who were previously unaware of the quick save option. Yes, it's the incredible adventures of Jebediah and his crack team of Kerbinauts. They are the Blunderbirds. Saving the Kerbin race one stranded explorer at a time. What is going on, you beautiful people of the internet, and welcome to another episode of The Blunderbirds. I know it is a long time coming, I've not made one for a while, but fear not, for we have one today, and it comes from our Reddit friend here, who has, unfortunately, left his Kerbal stranded on the surface of Duna, which I realise I've never actually done a Blunderbirds episode to Duna yet, and I feel like it's one of those places that a lot of people visit on their first interplanetary mission. I mean, I personally tend to recommend EVE as your first potential interplanetary destination, just because it's a lot easier to get to, and you can just send like a rover or something that won't return to it, but digressions aside, here we are, launching what some of you may remember as Blunderbird 2, which was from Blunderbirds Episode 2. And much like the Thunderbird 2, this is not only, well I guess Thunderbird 2 isn't an SSTO, but it's a single stage aircraft, but we we can replace the cargo bay that sits behind the cockpit. So obviously in Blunderbirds Episode 2, it had a cargo bay that we could put the rescued Munlander inside. Uh, well, I guess it wasn't rescued at that point, but you know, the stranded Munlander could dock, land inside the cargo bay, then the whole thing would fly back. Not necessary this time, so we can switch it out for a larger crew capacity. So you could almost consider this the spiritual successor to the Engadine SSTO for anyone that um, knows the uh, my SSTOs that well. But I'm getting a little bit off topic here. Yeah, I've, I've, I've done a lot of Junior SSTO videos and just SSTO videos in general. And I feel like I've, I've talked a lot about how to fly SSTOs and I've talked a lot about how to get to Junior as well. But you know what I haven't talked a lot about? And a topic that a lot of people have been requesting in the comments and that is, of course, Story time with Matt. Thank you. Thank you. I should get a. I should get a jingle. I should get a jingle for that. Maybe I should make a jingle for that. Can we play a jingle? So, um, the first, the first ever um edition, uh, saga, of episode. Uh, the first time I told a story on this channel was um the story about how I see dead people. How I saw dead people, I should say, in university when I was training, when I was just a wee lad, um. Uh, we, we went. To, we were in the dissection rooms at university to learn more about anatomy and physiology. It's quite useful to actually see some cadavers to work on. Actually, see all the nerves and muscles in the in the in the flesh, literally. But uh, I also see living people in surgery, in eye surgery, to be precise. And you know, that's something that a lot of people might be interested in. Now, I'm not a surgeon, so I don't have any interesting tales from actually, you know, being a surgeon. But, you know, just standing around in the surgical thing, that's all I kind of really did. I spent a lot of it as a student, again, just to get an appreciation of, you know, muscle anatomy and things like that by seeing it being op muscles being operated on on a living person. Eye muscles, I should say. Um, I do kind of have a surgical role in my job, but it's not a... I, I, it's not very frequently I need, I'm need. i needed in surgery. It's mainly for, well, a lot of the surgeries I would be dealing with are eye muscle surgery, if you have what's called a squint or misalignment of the eyes, to give it its proper term, it's strabismus. What we have to do is, um, if the eyes turned inwards, we just weaken the muscle that's, is, that's responsible for pulling the eye inwards. If the eye turns in too much, it's because the muscle that pulls the eye inwards is working too hard. So what we do is we essentially remove it from the eyeball and stitch it a little bit further back to effectively weaken how much power it has. There are, this is only one kind of eye operation, but it's kind of the most commonly done. So for layman terms, that's generally what we're talking about in this video. Um, but yes, my role in surgery would be sometimes, I, I, I'm, the, I'm the guy that measures the degree of the squint, and that's kind of, those are the measurements that the surgeon uses to do the operation. So I'm, so I would sometimes, I can sometimes be there if they kind of stitch everything back together, but they put them on adjustable stitches or adjustable sutures. So what they do is they wake the patient up and I kind of do the measurements for the squint again and we can adjust to the length of the stitches dependent on what we find there. But it's very, it's not as commonly done as it used to be. It used to be done like on virtually every patient, but not so much these days. So I don't, I, for all intents and purposes, I don't have much of a surgical role anymore. Just very briefly, uh, touching on the footage on screen, well, the footage just gone, um, I'm not aiming for an equatorial orbit around Duna because the stranded lander doesn't actually sit on the equator, so I'm going in, I'm approaching Duna at an angle, and if all goes to plan, we won't even need to circulise, we can just launch 
straight into the atmosphere and enter and land kind of without bothering to circularize the way the lander will fall. Um, we should just be able to get to it. Anyway, that was all that was all I wanted to say about that. I just wanted to tell you about the first time I ever, when I was a, an idiot first year, a fresher, a young, fresh-faced 18-year-old going into a going into eye surgery for the first time, because it was quite an experience, because you have this image in your mind about what surgery is like, you know, you see it on TV, like a very, very solemn, kind of all dimly lit, apart from the big spotlight in the middle, you know, the pacemaker, the, the pacemaker sound, you know, the, the machines beeping away in the background, like boop, 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 and like, <laughs> of the ventilator and things, and everyone's like, oh, doctor, I need the, I need the scalpel, and I need the sponge, and it, it, it's not like that in real life. For one, there are these big windows in half the theatres, it's all very sunny, and there's always a radio playing, just like Radio 1, just playing in the background, and, you know, they all just have a bit of a natter as it's going on, really, they're just like, I remember the first surgery I went into, they were all talking about their favourite kind of cake, like, the surgeon was like, oh, I do love me a good carrot cake, me. And they were like, oh, no, no. They were all northern, apparently, in this in this, in this dramatic recreation I'm doing. And they're like, oh, no, no, no. For me, it's a good chocolate fudge cake. Oh, that's too rich for me. I was like, I'm just standing there thinking, bemused, kind of, you know, he's kind of, he's cutting into someone's eyeball. Is this really the time and place to be talking about cakes? But I suppose if you've been doing it for years and years, it becomes so second nature, you can kind of talk about other things as well. And doesn't that bring us nicely to our Duna landing? That wasn't actually the first attempt at land. It took a couple of attempts. I crashed and burned the first few times. There is a link in the description to a blooper, we blooper wheel. A blooper reel, if you want to watch some outtakes. Uh, luckily, there weren't actually that many outtakes. I finally learned to put um, engines on the base, on the bottom of my junior SSTOs to help facilitate easier landing. And obviously, we stick a load of parachutes to help it slow down as well once it's on the ground. And then we can just do a cinematic camera fly over to the stranded lander. We did overshoot a little bit. Unfortunately, the, the position it's in, that was not, it's not a very ideal place to land. It was on a very rough part of the terrain. So we had to just sort of fly over it a little bit. But luckily, jetpacks work on Duna. Not very well, but they do work. So we can just fly our Kerbal over as graceful, graceful, graceful landing um, to go meet Jebediah. And she is, I can tell you now, ladies and gentlemen, she is over the moon to see another Kerbal. Um, but enough... Enough running around. She's, she's, she just wants to get in to somewhere that isn't a Mark 1 cargo base. Is cargo bay? Cargo... P no. Command pod. That's the word I needed. So we can just fly her up, get her into the, uh, get her into the comfort of that 16-seat uh, passenger bay. She has lots of room to put her feet up. She has her own... She has her own private quarters. She has her own chest of drawers with some fresh clothes. And a, I'm sure there's a shower, jacuzzi. We've got a pool in there as well. So overall, I think she's going to be in a, in a spiffing mood once we get off the ground. I mean, this is obviously a very stressful moment for the Kerbals as well. So the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to spin this around so we're facing 90 degrees so we can sort of launch with the rotation of the planet to get the most efficient ascent. We're also going to use the last of our oxidizer to kick ourselves off the ground and get ourselves airborne using the rapiers. We probably could have taken off with just the nuclear engines, but I'll tell you now, the rapiers make it a hell of a lot easier. And we're going to be holding around 30 degrees on the nav pool. So I'll pitch it up a lot more initially to get out the thickest part of the atmosphere, but then we're going to pitch it about 30 degrees. This tends to be the best compromise between trying to ascend out of the atmosphere uh, but also not pitching up so much that we end up being sort of a bit end up functioning like a giant air brake because we're facing into the atmosphere if that makes sense we'll be creating too much drag if we're pitching up too much so 30 degrees tends to be the best way and also I didn't show this in the footage because I couldn't find the part of the footage where I showed it but I pumped the fuel into the back tanks so all the fuel that's sitting in the big tank behind the cargo bay, all of that was pumped backwards. Otherwise, we'd be too nose-heavy to uh, get off the ground. But anyway, where was I? I feel like I kind of introduced the topic of stories with Matt in eye surgery and then never actually elaborate on any actual story. So I remember the first time I ever went into eye surgery was when I was a fresh-faced 18-year-old student just going in to observe for the morning, just to get an idea about what muscle surgery looks like. And I remember the first patient, so the way this happens is we're all scrubbed up in the room and then uh, the patient gets wheeled in on a bed and then the anaesthetist, anaesthetist, I can't say that word, injects them with the general anaesthetic and that knocks them out in, in a very brief amount of time. But anyway, this six-year-old girl, she must have had a bit of a panic, because obviously the parent comes in as well and then and then she just started freaking out. She was wailing, she was screaming the roof down, kicking everything and she was like she just doesn't want to be injected and in the, like it was very stressful I was just like standing in the corner of the room just thinking do I should I help here or should I and I just sort of I just sort of stood there and just sort of looked looked around like I was 
I was doing something else. And in the end, these like they had to get like four nurses to come around and pin down our legs and arms. And they just like another one just produced this gas mask and just slammed it on her face and held it there. And she was just like still fighting and everything then just went and just like was obviously knocked out by the gas. And I was like, oh my god, it it looks like they killed her. And then obviously mum was stressed out this whole time and then she started crying and they had to escort her out. And I was just thinking, this is a very this is an incredibly traumatic experience. <laughs> Luckily, once she was under and she was wheeled in, the surgery went great. Everything went went by without a hitch. I was like, okay, maybe. And I was like, does that is it normally that bad? They're like, no, they're very very rarely that bad. I was like, okay, fair enough. So then we called in the next one, and it was this fourteen year old lad, but he had uh, special needs. I can't go too much into the details of any aspect of this story really because confidential confidentiality and all that. So I can't tell you which hospital this was in the country it wasn't where i work at now i know most of you won't know i work at plymouth i think but uh, it's it's not there or is it keeping this ambiguous uh but yeah the second one was like this big 14 year old with special needs and he again just didn't want to be injected at all like he was like at the one point he was standing on the bed like wailing and screaming like, again i had to go in nurses from the room next door to all come in and everyone had to like hold him down like, like two nurses per arm and like three nurses per leg and just others just sort of holding him down with like his mum was there holding his head down and everything. Out comes the gas mask. I was like, oh my god. And I was like, Cause does anyone need my help? I was like, no, Matt, you stay there. <laughs> I was like, we're professional. <laughs> okay, so. But again, once he was down, the surgery went fine. So I guess it was just kind of funny. The first two were just the most traumatic things ever. But then the third one, little old lady just coming in for a bit of squint surgery because uh, squint surgery is when your eyes are slightly misaligned and you need to just straighten them up again by. Uh, if your eye turns inward too much, then you can just weaken the muscle responsible for turning the eye inwards. If it turns outward too much, you can weaken the muscle that's responsible for pulling the eye outwards. And that, is, and the latter of those is the surgery she was having. And the way you operate on this muscle is you take a set of tweezers and you pinch what's called the conjunctiva, which is like the clear tissue that covers the white of the eyeball, and you turn the eyeball to a position it would never normally be able to turn. And when we turn it so much, you can actually end up exposing the muscle. So then you can just hold the eye in that, you can just use a little tool that holds the eye in that turned position. And then you can just cut through the conjunctiva to get to the muscle. And you essentially, actually, you grab the muscle with a set of like, I don't, I'm trying to use sort of layman terms here. They're like, it's kind of like a pair of scissors that's blunt. It just holds things. Um, so it grabs onto that and then you just basically snip the muscle off completely. And then you use the clamp to put the muscle a little bit further back, a few millimetres further back, and then you stitch it back onto the eyeball. And this effectively weakens how much power it has. Anyway, they did that, grabbed the muscle, but then, disaster struck, it came free and shot to the back of the eyeball, um, or shot to the back of the eye socket. And when this happened, this is called a lost muscle, and that is a very dangerous thing to happen. It's like, oh my god. They had to spend a very long period of time just digging around the back of the eye socket, trying to, because you don't do any cutting of skin like i say you just turn the eyeball to it so they're gonna have to go in with these instruments just trying to dig around it sometimes it can take hours they managed to get it and dragged it back and held it and like stitch it stitch it stitch it stitch it and it was whew, everything seemed to go fine and then as they were kind of sewing it back together they were just like um we're missing a suture needle oh my god it's not please don't tell me it's in the eye socket still <laughs> it was somehow so everyone including me on our hands and knees in the in the uh, theater just scrambling around trying to find this lost needle very stressful, but luckily we found it. It wasn't in the eye socket, luckily. Every surgery, I came out of that day thinking, oh my god, I never want to have surgery again. But luckily, that, those are the only three times that surgery kind of went bad for me. I've seen other kinds of surgeries that have been very interesting, like orbital decompression. If anyone knows someone with thyroid eye disease, when the eyes, when the muscles around the eye are very swollen, there's a lot of fluid, and the pressure ends up building inside the eye, so what you can do is you can basically break the walls and floor of the eye socket to relieve the pressure. I'm talking very layman terms again, but that's essentially what it is. And it's very violent. They're going in with a hammer and chisel, just banging away, breaking their bones to decompress the eye. I mean, it's a, it's a necessary thing because if the pressure builds up, that can just destroy the sight, which is obviously the main thing you're concerned about with the eyes. But that was an interesting thing to see as well. And uh, yeah, I've seen a lot of other surgeries as well, but it's just uh, those three incidents just stick out to me because like I say, it just gave me a really bad impression of surgeries and surgeons, but then I've seen loads and loads of surgeries since and none of them have ever been like that. But that pretty much wraps this video up. So I hope you enjoyed um, this episode of The Blunderbird and I guess story time with Matt because that's now a series apparently. And uh, yeah. That was the end of this video, like I say, so on screen there are links to the full Blunderbirds playlist, 
as well as links to the music video version of this video and then the last video on screen is just specially selected for you by YouTube's algorithm. So other than that, Patreon is in the description, Discord's in the description, and Twitter. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.